over the past years, we've been working on goals and part of Academy has become to look at what has been happening around the goals that we voted on. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and that's what we're going to do now. And we're going to start with Nate to talk about uh, the automation and systemization uh, goal. So please, applause for Nate. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the panel. So today I'm going to talk about the automation and systematization goal. This is a goal that was chosen last year, so this is going to be kind of a mid-cycle update. So let's get into it. First, let's start with a little bit of background about KDE and why the structure of KDE makes this goal important. Uh, all of us in KDE are aware that KDE is a multi-generational organization, and KDE's contributors have a defined life cycle as well as different stages that we often move through. Uh, at the beginning, we have people who start out as students or young hackers in university. Uh, these people in this group are marked by having lots of time, lots of passion, lots and lots of contributions to KDE. Then time marches on, as it always does. People become young single professionals, and their KDE time becomes hobby time. Uh, at this point in time, people have jobs, and jobs take up more time. And as a result, KDE contributions tend to fall off a little bit. Then time continues its vicious cycle, and people become professionals established in their careers. They have families, and KDE time often drops off quite a bit. And then finally, if all goes well, people retire. They become financially successful. They have time for KDE again. But one thing you can see with all of these different uh, groups that people can fall into is that the amount of time that we have for KDE changes. That means there's a lot of turnover in KDE. One thing we're really good at is making sure that people cycle in and out and learn from each other. But it's really important that we keep the knowledge that people bring into KDE and it must stay in KDE. Uh, people bring knowledge all the time. They work on cool stuff. Some of that knowledge gets passed on to other people, and then we learn from each other. I think all of us have had that experience. Some of that becomes embedded in technical processes that we work on and that we contribute to. And unfortunately, some of that knowledge just gets lost when people leave KDE. And that's the thing that we really want to try to avoid. And that's the thrust of this goal, is how can we minimize that knowledge leakage when people inevitably leave KDE, either temporarily because they've moved on to a new phase of their life, or permanently for whatever reason, which is fine because people come and go. But we want to make sure that their knowledge stays within KDE. There are many different types of knowledge that gets lost. So let's go over that a little bit. Uh, the first type of leaky knowledge is processes that are done by hand and generally not documented. These are things we really want to avoid. Uh, the next is when people have personal tools that they write for themselves to take care of certain things, but then they don't share them publicly. When those people go away, the personal tools are essentially lost as well. Next, we have public tools, which is better. Public tools are better than private tools but the public tools have to be documented or else nobody knows how to use them when people go away and then they get rewritten because it's easier to rewrite than to understand. Um, and also these public tools sometimes are not run automatically for automatic periodic processes and that's important too, to make sure that people retain knowledge of how to use them. Finally, we have, not finally, second to finally, we have knowledge that is gained alone and not shared. This happens when we learn something, but we don't talk to other people about it. Talking to other people is really important. Um, and documentation also has to be kept up to date. When it's not kept up to date, it's not useful. All of this leads to the very familiar feeling of, if I stop doing this, it won't get done. And then you feel like you have to keep doing it. And if you don't, everything you're working on will end up as an ancient ruin, like this. So. That's not a good thing. We want to avoid that feeling. Uh, the basic problem here is that working alone sucks because you end up doing the same work that other people have done before. You end up fixing the bugs that other people have fixed in the past. 
you end up getting your merge request nitpicked to death with style comments because people have different opinions on what should or shouldn't be there. Uh, you end up talking to users about the exact same problems that you've fixed over and over and over and over again. You end up triaging the same bugs over and over again. And eventually, when you decide to go on vacation, nobody takes over what you were working on, and so it eventually gets dropped on the floor. These are things that are very unpleasant. They tend to lead to people burning out, leaving KDE, not having an enjoyable time, and we want for those things not to happen. So you don't turn into this guy and destroy your computer because then you really can't work on KDE stuff. So the solution is to externalize your knowledge, to get it out of your own head. It's really important for the thrust of this goal that we be scripting our tasks and that we have those scripts, especially if they're for periodic tasks, that they get run automatically rather than manually. They need to be documented so other people can run them too, so that if one person is gone, then another person can take over without missing a beat. Uh, we want to make sure that if people are doing similar tasks, that we consolidate the tooling that they're using so that each person isn't having, say, personal scripts that they're running that only works for them and that it only works for their process and another person does a different thing. Not great. We need to collaborate on that. Uh, we need to make sure that we're keeping up to date on test cases because it sucks to fix a bug that's been fixed over and over again. I think most of us have had this experience. It's not fun. It's easier to write a test case and then it won't happen again. Uh, we want to make sure that our code is well commented. We want the comments to be good. We want the comments to explain the why, not the what. The what is usually pretty obvious. The why often is not obvious. Um, Git history, I will mention real fast, is not a substitute for code comments because you don't see the Git history at the moment when you are reading the code. <laughs> Depends on your client, right? <laughs> Depends on your tools. So if you're using Kate, which all of you should, then Kate has an amazing plugin that can show you the very last comment, the very last uh, commit that touched a particular line, but all of that is a more indirect process than just seeing a comment right there in the code that explains what's going on. It can even reference the Git history, and you can go there for extra information, but it is not a substitute because otherwise some well-meaning do-gooder who does not have an editor set up the way yours is will look at this code and they'll say, why did some idiot write it this way? I'll just rewrite it. And then a whole rabbit hole gets gone down and it wastes everybody's time. Uh, we should also be making sure that stylistic stuff is done with, um, with, auto, with uh, uh, auto tests and with CI so that we're not endlessly arguing over whether there should be semicolons at the end of lines for QML JavaScript code. This is a waste of everybody's time. Doesn't matter, yes, no, who cares, let's just standardize it. Uh, we should have bots triage bugs as much as possible because bug triage takes forever and it is not a fun thing to do. A lot of this stuff can be automated by bots and we also have to make sure that our documentation remains up to date because we're actually using it. That's the best way to make sure it happens. If we're not reading our documentation, we won't notice problems and we won't see that it needs to be fixed. So when it comes to what's happened over the last year, a lot of really cool things have gotten done. We've had 12 months. That's pretty good. Uh, I want to go over real fast some of the things that we've managed to accomplish. We've added tons more auto tests everywhere. Uh, personally, I'm involved in the Plasma project. I've seen a lot there. There are a number of apps where people have added helpful auto tests. This is a really useful thing. We've gotten a whole new testing framework uh, using a system called Selenium that allows us to do user interface testing. Selenium is really cool because it also goes through the accessibility API. So in order to make it work in the first place, you have to have adequate accessibility support in your software. So this gets to two goals at once because at the same time that you improve accessibility, you make your software more testable. And when you do test your software, you're making sure that the accessibility code is being exercised and that it doesn't bit rot over time, because if it does, you'll notice it, and that's really great. We have, for the, uh, for the KDE SRC build script that many of us use for compiling software, we now have a dependency regeneration tool that automatically makes sure that uh, the dependencies for each KDE repo is up to date, that's really great. We have tooling for updating apps on the Microsoft Store, which has been written over the last year. That's some really amazing stuff. We have 
a, an increasingly large set of changes to make tests mandatory to pass on your software so that you can't press the merge button if the tests are failing. This is excellent. We're not 100% there yet, but anything is better than the 0% we had a couple of years ago. Uh, we have a Bugzilla bot now, and the Bugzilla bot takes care of various bug triage tasks, simple things at the moment, saying things like, hey, you're using a version of the software that's too old, report it to your distro, um, things like that. We have updated a ton of outdated documentation over time to make it useful so that people can actually start using it. We also have continuous integration jobs to build flat pack bundles for many apps, which makes them easier to test and also allows us to see when that process breaks. So now it doesn't break as often, which is great. We have CI jobs to enforce code formatting in C++ in some projects. This is something that we have in some repos and not all repos, but it's really cool stuff and it has saved us from a ton of arguing over code style and merge requests, which saves everybody's time for more useful things. We also have a CI job to validate JSON files now that everything has been ported to JSON, which is used to auto-generate desktop files. So now you don't have the experience of accidentally breaking your JSON file right after you hit the merge button, which is no fun and wastes everybody's time. So you can see a, a theme here, which is let's not waste everybody's time. Uh, finally, we also have a hook script to prevent you from changing translated text in Git now that translations live in Git repos, we were seeing a bunch of people saying, ooh, this is great. This means I can now do translation work in Git. <clears throat> Can't do it. So now we have a thing that tells you so that we don't have people explaining that over and over again, which was no fun. There are many ways, if any of this sounds interesting, that you folks can help to do this. Uh, one of the biggest ones is to write more Selenium UI tests for apps that have the framework set up. This directly benefits multiple goals, as I mentioned earlier, it also helps to test the accessibility stuff. And if your app does not currently have Selenium set up, set it up. It's really cool. There is a wiki page that explains how to do that. Uh, some of this is linked to in the, uh, in the goals wiki page, which I'll get to at the very end. Another thing you can do, which is a, a very, in some cases it's sort of a low hanging fruit, is to make tests mandatory to pass before merging. If your project is in the fortunate state that all of its auto tests already pass, fantastic. Immediately go turn on the thing that says that they have to keep passing. So then they, they won't just start failing at some point in the future because that will happen. We also want to make sure that we are adopting much more widely the code formatting stuff so that we don't have as much arguing and merge requests about that. That's another small thing that is relatively easy to do from a technical standpoint. From a sociological standpoint, it's harder, but you can say, Nate told you to just do it, and then people will yell at me and not you, and that'll be easier. Uh, we have this KDESRC dep regeneration script that I mentioned earlier. That's something that could be automated so that it runs periodically, and then Nicholas over there doesn't need to manually run it once a week, which I assume is a waste of his time. Uh, we also have the Bugzilla bot. The Bugzilla bot is written in Ruby. It's rather approachable. We can make this smarter so that it's doing more of our work for us and we have less bug triage to do. Basically, be lazier. I want all of you to go out and be much lazier so you have less busy work to do. Because in the process of being lazier, you're also helping to take the amazing knowledge that's in all of your heads and put it into KDE, where it can benefit from everybody and can even benefit you if you happen to leave and then come back later, because all of that won't be lost. There are also some even bigger ideas that I've got for this goal that have been worked on a little bit here and there, but really need the helping hand of technical experts to make this stuff possible. Um, basically, everybody I look at in this room is much smarter than me, so I'm looking at a whole room full of technical experts. I think that any of you folks, if you want to work on any of these things, this would be a fantastic way to help the goal. We've got tasks like consolidating release tooling. I think it's not lost on everybody that we have many different release vehicles. We have gear, we have frameworks, we have plasma, we have individual things with extra gear. If there would be a way for us to consolidate our release tooling so that it's something that can be run automatically and it's something that can work for all different release vehicles, that would be fantastic because it would make it much easier for people to be release managers and not so much of the work would have to be borne on one particular person so that that person feels stressed out if they happen to be on vacation when release day arrives, et cetera. Uh, there's also this other moonshot idea of using AI to triage bug reports. People keep asking, can you integrate ChatGPT and KDE? Can you integrate ChatGPT and KDE? And this is how we do it, in my opinion. 
we have a robot triage bug reports because this is something that robots can potentially be good at that none of us like to do, so let's do that if possible. Uh, this is something, the next thing is something that also helps for onboarding. If we could have KDE SRC build automatically install third party projects needed to build KDE stuff instead of making people go and do that themselves, that would be a huge help. That would cut down on an enormous amount of common chatter that people end up having to handle. Uh, in the same vein as AI to trash bug reports, we could have a chatbot answer common help questions, things like NVIDIA drivers and why does this update not work in Discover because my distro's update policy is completely broken, things like that. Uh, I'm sure all of us are very tired of answering these types of questions. I know I am. And if there's any way we can have a system do that, that would be much better. There are also ideas for how we could make our icon design pipeline much easier. It's a very manual process right now. It relies on information that is stuck in the heads of several people, some of whom I see in this room. And I think if there's a way that we could make this a more programmatic process by, say, having icons get generated by combining symbols together in a code pipeline rather than making everything manually get done in Inkscape, that would be fantastic. Uh, we could automatically generate app stream release notes from the commit message tags and from GitLab tags. We have all the plumbing needed to make this work. Uh, we even have support in AppStream itself, which has recently gained support for fetching remote release notes, which was the big blocker last time. It's just a matter of wiring it up. Then we don't have to spend so much time manually writing release notes for every single release. This could be a big benefit, I think. And uh, then there's also that This Week in KDE blog that some guy named Nate writes, which for some strange reason is not on KDE infrastructure yet. So maybe he could finally get off his butt and do something like that. I think that would be good for this goal as well. If any of this sounds interesting, you can get involved in a couple ways. Uh, I'm the gold champion. You can always contact me. I'm nate at kde.org. I'm around all the time. I think you probably know how to contact me. Otherwise, there is this kde.org slash goals link where you can find information about all the goals, including the automation goal. We also have a team on Invent that you can join. Uh, there's not much activity there in that particular space right now, so you can help change that. We have a buff session at noon on Tuesday that you can go to if this sounds like an interesting topic. And we also have a sprint planned for sometime next year. So keep your eyes and ears peeled for that. And with that, I would like to say thank you all for listening, and we can move on to the next one. Thank you so much, Nate. And we move on to accessibility with Carl. Um, tell us about accessibility, Carl. <laughs> Um, hello everyone, uh, I will talk about the second goals, about accessibility, uh, or as a like called KD for all, uh, because like we are an inclusive community, we want to have uh, our software to work for everyone, even people with disabilities who need to use a screen reader, or who can't use a mouse, or, yeah. Uh, uh, there's this quote from uh, Tim Bernalli, who is the uh, inventor of uh, the World Wide Web, who, who says that the power of the web is uh, in university and access by everyone, whereas the disability is an interesting aspect. And I think that also applies for KDE. Like, uh, yeah. yeah. So, why is that important? Um, I mean, it's good for us like, to reach more people. We do that as well, like, for example, by porting our software to Windows, or to Mac, or to Android. Like, uh, we don't want to only target uh, Linux users, but we also should not only target uh, people uh, who are like, experts with computers and uh, who can't uh, see uh, what is uh, the, the software. And uh, it's also like it benefits everyone. Uh, like even for normal user, being able to use the software with a keyboard 
uh, like for product users, it's quite important. Like they can be faster to use the software. Um, like for example, another aspect is that ch changing the fonts, like to increase the size of the fonts, also like useful for everyone, and not only uh, people with uh, uh, reduced, reduced uh, visions. Um, yeah, and I mean like accessibility as well includes usability generally. Like uh, of the software in general, and uh, another aspect is that uh, accessibility is uh, a requirement for public sectors, organizations, and if you want to be this organization to use the KDE software, uh, we should try to uh, make ensure what uh, KDE software uh, is uh, follows the requirements, uh, follows the accessibility requirements. Uh, so, uh, what did we do? Like uh, last year, it was um, uh, since, la since last year. I mean, uh, like we started testing our software um, with a screen reader or with a keyboard only to see what can be used with the keyboard or what can be like just like just by listening to the Orca, see what uh, or we can use the software currently, and that allowed to like find a lot of cases where it was not that great. <laughs> like often there was some um, tabbing loops where you just tab and you switch cycle between elements, but you don't go like over on the entire apps, which is an issue because then like the screen reader user or just a keyboard user won't be able to navigate the entire applications just with the tabs or the keyboard navigations. Um, and uh, we started writing an um, automated test with Selenium, like uh, Nate already said, uh, which is like a really cool framework to write test and also like ensure that your software is accessible. I mean, it doesn't ensure it, like it's still, still need to work on testing uh, with like a screen reader, but at least it helps a lot. Like, and, yeah, we had like actually multiple uh, season of Kadiv projects on that topic. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Richie uh, for Tokodon, and Joseph uh, did like work on uh, J'ai compris with uh, Selenium. Uh, we also had like uh, some blind users coming to the Kadiv accessibility channels, smart channels, and uh, testing the software for us, which was quite great. Like uh, to have like. Because like when you can see what the software is, it's a bit harder to, to imagine what the difficulties are. But when someone comes and tells you, yeah, that button's here, I don't know what to do. <laughs> uh, and then, oh, actually, that is a Kigami uh, um, driver handle to, uh, yeah, and that's how you detect uh, my functions. Uh. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we like, after our testing, we started like also improving the software. Uh, there was like many patches for uh, Plasma uh, created, and as well as the KDE applications. Uh, like a good example is Cleopatra. Uh, Ingo has a talk, I think, later today in the other room, uh, which hopefully like will give you a bit of uh, technical details and how we. Uh, made uh, Cleopatra good for accessibility. Uh, we include the KDE frameworks because, like, uh, if you ensure that the KDE frameworks are accessible, it's easier to build applications that are also accessible if you use uh, common shared components. Uh, we also did some improvement upstream in Qt. Uh, we sent uh, multiple patches to Qt to uh, improve accessibility. Um, for, for example, the buttons that um, it was a press action, something or the name was missing by default, and it was easy to fix. Like, but but what, what we get like by testing the software, we find easy things to to fix, and there's like a lot of areas where small improvements already make a lot of difference. And we also send a few patches to Orca itself, like the screen reader for Linux, the GNOME project. So it's uh, good to see like uh, 
cause this sort of collaboration and stuff like that. <sighs> yeah, so uh, what did you learn? Uh, yeah, I mean, like, uh, having the community vote on the goal doesn't make it magically ha happen. Like, we still need uh, to have more people working on the accessibility. Um, uh, there's also, like, not that much documentation from, for Q from the QT side about accessibility. And um, that's something that we should probably try to improve as the upstream. Um, I mean, there's like the documentation for the Q accessible class, but there's not a lot of documentation how to use that, best way to use that, or to make sure your application is uh, good with accessibility. And there's like a lot of um, documentations and blog posts about the web accessibility, but for Qt, there's not that much. Uh, yeah, so future. Um, yeah, I mean, like we should continue working on accessibility. Uh, it would be great like if you are more people joins. Uh, like we wanted to organize a sprint uh, next year with the other goals. And like for me, like personally, like uh, what I want to, to do more is uh, what more blog posts, like uh, do more community outreach uh, to make uh, more people aware in the community uh, of to improve accessibility, like also writing documentations and stuff like that. Um, I unfortunately <laughs> didn't really have a lot of time. Like it's always like I have like many projects aside from accessibility in Caddy, and so it's great like if more people would join and help with that. Um, no, ah, uh, it a bit substantial. Let me go back. Yeah, I don't. So how can you help? Like. Um, test applications, like install Orca and try to use application with Orca and see uh, how well it works. <laughs> um, yeah, working documentation is important uh, for Q to like document the best practices for Qt or for KD software in general. Um, for the world, like it will be like if someone could help me, like write blog posts and stuff like that about um, the current progress of the community would be really helpful. And like, uh, as of the tooling, uh, like, uh, I think Volker worked it a few years ago on uh, Gamma Array Accessibility Inspector. It would be great to revive this effort to be able to like, as well inspect uh, the accessibility state in Gamma Array as well as the other state, the visual state and everything. Uh, yeah, like uh, if you want to join, there's a KDE accessibility channel and matrix. It's also available on uh, ESC. And we have it both, both on the first day at uh, noon. And yeah, join us to print. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Carl. And that brings us to the third and final goal of um, sustainability with Joseph. Uh, let's see, presentation. Where? Mm -hmm. ah. There you go. Please, Joseph. Apologies for breaking the aesthetics. Um, I tried to convert the template to LaTeX, but it wasn't successful. <laughs> um, I'm actually Cornelius Schumacher. Um, he's the champion of this goal. Um, I'm here pretending to be him. So the usual disclaimer applies, any errors are my own, not Cornelius's. Um, yeah, I'm gonna pre present uh, about the sustainable software goal, which is part of this sort of larger KDE Eco initiative, um, which started a couple of years ago. Um, if you would like, the slides are available uh, to download at the sustainable software goal repository on Invent. Um, I'll come back to this at the end if, if uh, yeah, if you want, um, or if you have time now to scan it. Um, and I'm going to go over just a couple of the things that have happened since the goal has been adopted and, and voted for uh, in October last year. 
Um, one of the things is the publication of the KDE Eco Handbook. Um, this was the culmination of the work done in the Blauer Angle for Foss project, um, which ended in March. Um, but it also coincides with the sustainable software goal, and a lot of the topics addressed here are directly relevant for what the goal um, has. So the handbook, if you haven't seen it yet, um, is broken up into three parts currently. Um, the first part um, is meant for a general audience about why is this important, um, how does software influence resource and energy consumption. Um, the second part is about the Blue Angel eco-certification criteria and how they align with free and open source software. And the third part is how do you fulfill the criteria with detailed instructions about measuring software, following the guidelines in the, the Blue Angel criteria, um, and then fulfilling the other criteria in it. That's the first iteration. We want to continue expanding it, and I'll talk a little bit about that in just a minute. The, um, as many of you I'm sure know, Ocular was eco-certified uh, last year. Um, with the Blue Angel, currently it's the only software that's certified um, as uh, yeah, resource and energy efficient. Um, that eco-certification has opened up many new channels to KDE to present the work that uh, we are doing. Um, one of them, for example, is in December um, at the uh, Open UK Awards in uh, the uh, House of Lords in uh, London. Um, this was an event um, organized by the Open UK Advocacy Group, uh, which advocates for open tech. Um, the host um, of the event was uh, Francis Maud, who's a member of the House of Lords, um, and he's the minister who uh, a decade ago created the gov.uk website, uh, which um, provides information about um, open data, open formats, and policies uh, regarding that. Um, a co-host was KDE's own uh, Jonathan Riddell, um, and he was uh, there to also present uh, what KDE is doing in the KDE Eco Project. Um, so, yeah, really big channels open, uh, uh, have opened up to us um, in this regard. Another one um, was Cornelius, um, who presented at the uh, Green uh, Party event on green digitization, uh, Nakhatik by Design. Um, this was an event uh, that featured many prominent people, like Kari Doktorow gave a speech, the German, Germany's Vice Chancellor, um, Robert uh, Habeck, um, and Cornelius participated as an expert um, given the Blue Angel certification of Ocular in the Right to Repair workshop that was organized. And this um, event and this post um, was uh, a very popular post. It was it featured in Hacker News, and it was, uh, there's a huge spike in the views in the KDE Eco uh, Project website um, after this. Um, so it, it garnered a lot of attention. Um, and another project, or several projects, um, um, not just from KDE Eco, but from the season of KDE in general, um, was uh, reported on in HISA uh, DE, um, which is a big publication for tech news in Germany. Um, it featured all of the season of KDE projects, but the um, eco ones were particularly prominent. Um, this year we had three projects uh, working on sustainability issues. Um, one was this tool that was designed by Emmanuel um, Charu, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, called KDE EcoTest, and this tool uh, was, is designed to make um, usage scenario scripting um, easy and robust. Um, so the existing tools that there are um, have various issues, and this is trying to make it so that the process is um, simple, like some of the tools, but more robust because it's not based on pixel um, 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 locations for uh, the emulation. Um, but rather working on um, um, command line um, triggering of actions when you're trying to uh, emulate user behavior. Um, this tool was quite limited and it's now been expanded to have many more features uh, from Mohammed Ibrahim. Um, we had another project which was uh, looking at the uh, documentation for Ocular, trying to extend it to uh, Kate in particular, and that was from uh, Rudraksh Karp. Um, and then, um, as has been mentioned now by both the other goals, the Selenium testing. Um, so uh, just a, a small correction, I wasn't actually working on the GCompre testing, uh, it was Nitin, 
um, who did excellent work um, using Selenium to emulate user behavior for GCompre. And um, as uh, Emmanuel uh, wrote in a blog post, um, this is a project that actually hits all three goals. Um, Nate has already talked about um, automation. Um, uh, Carl has already talked about accessibility. It's also used for uh, usage scenario scripting to emulate user behavior so that we can have reproducible energy consumption results for software. Right now, um, there's a project going on in Google Summer of Code, um, which is um, trying to make the lab that we set up uh, last year in KDAB Berlin um, to measure the energy consumption of software accessible remotely. Um, so, so all this outreach is great, um, but the actual reason we're doing this is because we want to measure energy consumption of software and drive it down when we can. And this remote, ex remotely accessible lab will make that much more easy to do. Um, so the idea here in the lab is that, so the lab is set up uh, with hardware, dedicated hardware for measuring the energy consumption of software, a power meter, an external power meter that's just uh, measuring all of the energy draw um, when using the computer, and then it's then aggregated onto another computer which collects the results and then you can analyze them. And the idea is to set up a um, interface through the GitLab CI so that you can um, upload your code and then tell you want to do this test. It will then send the commands to the uh, lab in KDAB Berlin, um, run your scripts, um, give you the results in a uh, usable format, um, and then give it back to you so that you can see the energy consumption of your software. And if you're interested in, in uh, eco-certifying it, this would also be one of the um, criteria for eco-certification. So we're trying to make this automated and easy and accessible to everyone. Um, this is just a bit more details about it. Um, so the, um, uh, the software will be installed as a flat pack uh, bundle, um, and then that's then uh, yeah, run on the, soft, on the, the hardware at the lab, um, and then this is then analyzed. Um, just another uh, uh, thing that we're, that we're working on is an awesome list uh, for sustainable software. Um, this is, again, at the, the Sustainable Software Repository. Um, there's a great list of resources um, related to uh, general green coding, um, best practices, as well as how do you measure software, what tools exist, et cetera. So check that out. If you have some uh, resources that you want to contribute to it, uh, please do so. Um, there's several talks that are taking place uh, today, tomorrow, and next week. Um, related to the sustainable software goal. Um, so one is right after this. Um, Volker is gonna uh, present about uh, measuring the energy consumption of software. Um, tomorrow, uh, Harold is gonna present uh, Selenium GUI testing, which is relevant for all of the goals. And um, Monday, we're going to have a, uh, a BOF um, for measuring software. So come by if you're interested in um, the process of how to measure your software. There are other many related talks. These are just a couple that uh, stood out for me. Um, so on Saturday, there's the Flatpak and KDE from Albert. Um, as you saw, Flatpak is part of the uh, remote uh, Ecolab um, process. Um, documentation, that's also come up several times. and. Um, this is maybe not obvious uh, how it relates to uh, sustainability. Maybe it is, I'm not sure. Um, if we want to achieve a um, sustainable circular economy for software and also hardware, we need documentation for repair and reuse of software, right? This is the sustainable angle on that. We can't um, um, use the software uh, long term and keep hardware in use long term if we don't know um, if we don't have the documentation for, for how to uh, um, use it and repair it and et cetera. Um, another topic um, that I just uh, thought might be interesting to, to think about in terms of sustainability, the KDE embedded. Um, embedded uh, systems are not the systems that were um, targeted by the Blue Angel certification. The Blue Angel is 
trying to address the issue where hardware is getting more and more powerful and software is becoming less and less efficient because of it. It lets us get lazy. Embedded systems are the exact opposite. You have a limited amount of computing power and you have to optimize to fit that. And it has, I'm sure, many overlapping um, topics of the uh, sustainability efficiency side in terms of optimization. So I just thought I'd point that out. Um, and then there's another talk which is looking at um, incorporating um, uh, green energy information from solar panels um, directly into KDE Plasma, um, which is all happening in the next two days. Um, so, so what are the things that we have on our to-do list? So as part of the uh, Selenium Season of KDE project, um, Nitin wrote a guide which we want to add to the KDE Eco Handbook as the, the next chapter. Um, we need people to test the guide to see um, yeah, what, what needs to be uh, included or removed or what's uh, accurate or inaccurate. Um, so if you have a chance and you're interested in, in um, checking out Selenium uh, GUI testing, um, maybe check out the guide and see um, how it works for you and give us some feedback on it. Um, another idea we've had for a while now is this idea of a KDE Eco badge. Um, so Eco certification is nice, it's third party, independent of KDE, um, but we can also do something that's internal and uh, define certain criteria that we say this is important for KDE software. And if you fulfill these criteria, you get a little badge that says, you know, you're fulfilling the um, sustainable software goals of KDE. Um, if you're interested in, in uh, working on this, uh, please be in touch. Um, we've already started uh, taking some steps towards an eco tab that would be included in KDE software. So you have the about uh, contributors tabs. Um, and then we'd add an eco tab, which would then highlight aspects of that software which are sustainable um, from things like eco certification, but also links to documentation, source code. Um, if uh, there are measurement data that aren't part of a certification um, process, you can still link to it and that's um, relevant for sustainability issues. Um, if you're interested in working on that, please be in touch. Um, if you have other ideas, um, you're more than welcome to join. We have monthly meetups every uh, second Wednesday. Um, and then there is a matrix room and several other things which I forgot to put in the slides and uh, you can find that information at eco.kde.org. Um, it's quite easy to find. Um, and then regarding the sort of general unifying aspect of having goals, um, uh, one of the ideas that came up when discussing the presentations here was having maybe crossover presentations in the different uh, groups. So we have this monthly meetup and we like to Im invite people who are working on accessibility or work working on automation to come into our meetup and maybe discuss ways that it overlaps with um, what we're doing in the sustainability. Um, so if you're interested in that or if the champions are interested in that, maybe that's something we could talk about. Um, yeah, there's already been mentioned a joint sprint next year. Um, any other ideas we can discuss in the panel? And I believe that's it. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and now we have quite some time for questions either about any of the specific goals or the goal process as a whole. And I believe Aid will be the mic runner and um, we, I take will questions. run around. Questions? Uh, I don't know if this is too detailed or not uh, able to be answered, but uh, how hard uh, was to get ocular to get the certification did something needed to be changed was it many changes was it difficult yes how was that experience like to get the to that level so the most labor intensive aspect of it is the uh, usage scenario scripting and the measurement process um, which if you're going to start adopting selenium you're already taking care of a big chunk of that work um, and as well as accessibility and automation. Um, so, uh, so we can incorporate maybe some of this, that, that work into the general uh, development process. Um, and then the measurement is just a matter of having the access to an, a, a suitable lab um, for fulfillment. Everything else is just documentation. Free and open source software is recognized as being a, um, a more sustainable approach to uh, digitization, um, given 
various aspects of the way it allows uh, users to have more autonomy about how the software is used, um, which can influence energy consumption, um, removing vendor dependencies so that you can continue to support hardware over a longer time, et cetera, et cetera. These are all things I think we take for granted and have, you know, this is obvious, um, but there, this is putting it in terms of a sustainability um, uh, angle. And that part of the criteria are actually just documentation, just showing um, how you fulfill these criteria. So, thank you. Thank you. This is an, a hybrid conference. We have questions from online, and Neophytos is going to be the voice of online. Here you go. Actually, there was Alan asking a question about the lab, and how do we make sure to be able to compare over time the power consumption of our software if the material used there changes? And I see Cornelius stepped up and is answering it, so I don't know if, Joseph, you want to add anything to that? Or? So the question was, how do we make the results um, usable over time so that we can compare? Yes. Um, as, as the hardware changes, how, what do you do to keep it up to date, to keep the measurements up to date? Yeah. So, one, so right now in the lab, we have um, a few different computers, one of which is the recommended hardware for the Blue Angel certification, then we have some others. One of the goals, the like uh, moonshot goals, um, is to have several options of hardware where you can say, I want to test it on this hardware, um, which might be a little bit older, or I want to test it on more recent hardware. Um, um, but I, I think the, the, the answer to that is documentation of which hardware was used so that you have a maximally similar uh, environment if you were to retest and want to compare the results directly with the test that you did previously. Great, thank you, Joseph. And then there's another one for Nate. Um, it says, wasn't there a prior effort at an Icon design pipeline called Icona? What happened to that? That's a good question. Uh, Icona was a standalone app that would have definitely helped for the icon design pipeline proposal. This was an app that would be used to preview an icon that had already been made in various environments against various backgrounds. The idea that I was bringing up on that slide was more to aid the process of creating the icons in the first place, which right now is quite an error-prone process and requires understanding of the details of how XML inside um, SVG files works. So I think there's definitely some work that can be done at the end to verify the end result, but I also think it's important that we make the process of getting there so that there is an end result a little bit easier. Hi, I have a question about uh, the KDE Eco uh, for the, the measurement process of, uh, of the application. I can imagine that you somehow need to make sure that no other software installed on the test device interferes with the actual measurement uh, of the application that you're testing. How do you approach this? So right now it's just very simply turning off anything that could <laughs> interfere when you're measuring. Um, uh, we have discussed ways to have a um, record a state that the uh, software was in when you start the first measurement and then putting it back to that state um, um, for each measurement so that you have a maximally similar environment. Um, also, as each me measurement goes, you're gonna be changing the, the system a little bit. Um, right now, the way we're dealing with that is just removing the, um, the configuration files that might have been changed um, and any files that may have been produced during the measurement um, so that it gets back to a maximally similar state. But that is an area that we certainly could you know, look at later once we get everything set up and the first step is achieved and then we can start thinking about um, how we can improve that process. So I have one more question regarding the measurement lab. Like, could you have a plan to add to, uh, support for mobile devices because like Plasma Mobile is the one of the things we support and like that's where actually the energy efficiency is more useful because like you don't want your mobile devices battery to drain completely. So do you have, have plan to support mobile devices? Short answer, no. Um, uh, I mean, so right now, they, um, it's not what we're working on right now, but the Blue Angel certification is ex um, extending their criteria to include um, mobile apps. 
um, and client server systems, and they might have some, um, some, some tooling there that could be useful for uh, measuring mobile apps. Um, at the moment, um, I, don't, I don't know how um, we would do that um, in our lab with the setup that we have, so. Okay, thank you. I have a question for Carl. Um, you mentioned that accessibility is also very important if you want public institutions to select your software. Do they have some requirements, like you have to have a certificate maybe, or do they do their own testing, or is it just we tell them we made sure our software is accessible? Um, I think it depends. I mean, like for the web, there is like uh, the standard VCAG, standard, uh, there's like multiple levels, and usually institutions want to level AA at least. And then there's some uh, companies who do certification for that. I was involved in the past with Nestcloud, we did that with Nestcloud. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's usually like a really certification, like you, you need to. <laughs> Hi, I have a question to Kirk. How's the, the status of the accessibility in the Wayland environment? Uh, can you repeat? Uh, how's the status of the accessibility in the Wayland environment? Um, I mean, Orca works on Wayland. I can use, uh, I'm using Wayland uh, full time, and um, I could use Orca, and it's working. Uh, but I think there are still like, a few stuff that uh, would be better to improve but uh, I'm not that familiar with that area. We've sort of got an answer here. <laughs> so there are definitely some things that don't quite work properly accessibility-wise in a Wayland session. A lot of the um, keyboard-related accessibility features like sticky keys, slow keys, that kind of stuff, that's used to be implemented by the X server, but on Wayland, that's not a thing anymore. So we get to implement that ourselves in Quinn and a lot of that is missing. I've recently worked on some of that, but it will take a few more patches to get it on parity with X there. I like this setup where we get answers from the audience. So maybe the <laughs> panel has a question for... <laughs> Do any of you have ideas how to measure uh, mobile systems in, in a lab? <laughs> we got an answer. <laughs> um, yeah, we built a custom, um, so we hacked an Android device so that we removed the, the battery and we, had a, we basically built a fake battery which is uh, connected to the power um, and uh, that's how we're actually using the power consumption. Uh, so like it's on battery, because of course most of the Android devices cheat when they're on battery. They, they remove some power features or add them. Um, we had the issue, uh, for example, for VLC, where we have where, um, higher priority when we are plugged on, on, the, on, the, on an actual plug. So that's how we did it. And so these devices, then we have a RS-232 to just read the timings. Um, it's a mess. <laughs> Let's talk anyway at some point. <laughs> <laughs> to add to that answer, uh, Arm Corp Incorporated has, has like these giant labs of hooked up devices with relays to reset them. And there's, there's hardware setups for that. Other questions or answers? <laughs> So, so I'm not directly involved, but Collabra runs a Lava Lab to do a bunch of the tests for Chromebooks and Android. So they may have some, it, there's definitely some ways to use Lava to do that kind of thing. Let's talk. <laughs> <laughs> so next up we want to... Uh, so again, from... Uh, the internet. Uh, regarding ECO certification, there's a question, is there an ongoing measurement that is taken each time the software is released to ensure there are no regressions or minimal regressions uh, in power usage over time? So, let me just make sure I understood. So is there an ongoing um, measurement 
process so that we can then see if it's improving or getting, uh, getting yeah, worse. Yeah, the, the way I understand it. That's the idea. After you get the certificate, is there something ongoing so to measure? For the certification, you need to measure it regularly. Um, the exact details of that are a bit in a gray area. Um, but yes, you're supposed to measure it regularly. Um, and right now, our approach is that uh, we want to measure major releases. Um, but first, we want to get the lab set up for easy accessibility. So once we have that, then the idea would be then for major releases to have regular measurements. And, and that's required for the eco certification as well. Great, thanks. And maybe, sorry, just um, one more thing to add to that. The eco certification requires that it doesn't increase, the energy consumption doesn't increase by over 10% during uh, the time of certification from when it was certified. So there are requirements on staying within a limit. So that means we could lose the certification at some point, right? Yes. Okay. So we need to be careful. <laughs> yes. Can't get more than 10% worse. <laughs> so we got 10% worseness to, to play with. OK. Make the world a better place with your question. It's just a small follow-up question. Um, like, do we need to redo the entire certification process in case we lose it? Or do we just need to um, go under the threshold of 10% and get the certification again? Good question. I don't know. <laughs> Hopefully, we don't find out. <laughs> but you're gonna, you're in, in, in motivating me to find out. So I'll see if I can find that information. So my question would be: Do you do tests on a certain device where they are using Plasma and KD software extends the life cycle of? For example, in an organization, uh, that is, are there some tests to show how much e-waste can you uh, not have if you use Plasma than if you use Apple devices or Windows devices? Um, no. Uh, the requirements of the certification, um, you have to state the minimum system requirements and demonstrate that it can run in hardware that's at least five years old, which I think is way too low. Um, I, one of the things that I have in mind that I would like to work on at some point is a campaign on uh, e-waste reduction uh, with free software. And I think gathering data about hardware that is no longer supported by the two major vendors um, and can still run uh, free software um, and getting some documentation of that would give us at least some idea of um, which devices, if not the numbers of how many, which devices would otherwise end up in the landfill um, but can remain in use because of free software. So if I could add something to that answer, um, something a little bit more on the concrete side. Uh, in the town where my parents live, my mother is involved in a community organization that is actually doing exactly that right now. They currently have 80 um, desktop computers that are over 15 years old that would have become e-waste recently and are instead being loaded with Kubuntu and used to teach computer classes and given away to low-income students. So there's a specific example of how using eco-friendly software can directly prevent e-waste. Uh, mine was instead uh, uh, to jump again on the accessibility uh, topic. Uh, I just remembered another partial answer to uh, how is the accessibility status on Wayland. Uh, another thing specifically to Orca, uh, the actual screen reader part just works for the most part. Uh, one thing of Orca that doesn't work at the moment, I think, uh, uh, unless was was fixed recently, but I don't think, is that it has a feature that can do uh, something like putting a rectangle over the button that is yeah. now reading uh, that at the moment cannot work on Wayland for the absolute positioning yeah. stuff. And there isn't a clear solution yet. Um, I guess the final solution will involve some, uh, as usual, a new protocol as every Wayland problem, mm -hmm. but that will need to be 
thinking about. Yeah, yeah I mean, the, there's the same issue with Asiasis, uh, which is like the software where you can analyze the state of the accessibility of the e program, and you can also like show the red rectangle, and that doesn't work on Wayland. One more question. Thank you. We've got time for one more question. You've already asked one. You're new. I think we even can do two. We can do two. <laughs> um, so this one's kind of for all of them, right? so, although it sounds like the eco guys are already doing it. As an app developer, is there plans to create like checklists of stuff that I can be doing to help uh, to meet the accessibility goal, to meet the automation goal? It sounds like the eco guys are doing it with the handbook already. That's also the idea of the badge. Um, which is something we really should consider doing, setting up a sort of, if you fulfill these things, um, you, re you reach, you know, recognized within the community um, as, as reaching a certain sustainability goal. Yeah. Um, but not yet. That's definitely something we should do. I think it's a good idea, too. All of the goals can probably benefit from this. There's a lot of overlap. You know, if you do the Selenium GUI testing, you're basically doing all three at once. Um, from the automation perspective, there's the obvious stuff like have a continuous integration system, do testing, make sure that your tests are passing, things like that. I mean, for the accessibility, it's the same thing. Like, it's a good idea to have like a, maybe like a checklist. Like, yeah. And the very last question. Uh, thank you. Uh, I heard you mention before that uh, you have an energy budget of 10%. Uh, you could lose the certification if you govern, you're not sure. Uh, is it possible that this measurement and this uh, process to certify this, is it scalable to be automated so that when you merge or when you do a new release, it's like part of GitLab and can it, how scalable it, it is for it to be part of the release process, both of uh, Ocular and other uh, Plasma applications. So how can we integrate it into the development process? Yes. Is the, yeah. um, so that's the idea of this CI um, uh, uh, yeah, um, runner that we can have then if we want to measure, um, you can then uh, simply make your merge uh, and then test in the lab. That's sort of the goal um, with that. Uh, so yeah. uh, do you think that it's something that is going to, I, I'm going to merge something? And is it going to, I'm going to wait like five hours for to, to get the answer? Like how's the? If, yes, but we can probably talk about that. I mean, this is something that maybe actually if other people in the, who are involved have ideas, um, but we can certainly um, des design it to fit our needs. If you want to do eco certification, you need a certain number of uh, measurement runs to have a statistically uh, relevant measurement, but if it's just for you know a quick thumbs up, thumbs down kind of measurement, I'm sure there are ways to um, shorten that process. So we can we can talk about how to design it so that it fits our needs. All right, then thank you very much. If you have more questions um, during lunch, these guys will be available to you. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs>